Hi, I'm Mary Kay Smith. I lead the Earth Stewardship East, which is LDS Earth Stewardship's regional group for Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. And I'm really happy to be here with you tonight talking about less lawn, more life. The first few slides I have to share are of some members of our my home ward, Cantlin's Ward in Maryland. The Morgans have a typical United States uh, property homeowners. The property is about a quarter of an acre, but what's not typical is they have no lawn and they have instead a wide variety of plants and several ponds. It's a beautiful garden to visit and as you see when I was there, uh, first thing I saw is they of course got frogs since they've got ponds and birds and lots of insects visiting. It's just a beautiful life-filled garden. No lawn, no lawn mower. This is a property of a Markoff's a family in our ward. They built this home themselves, a place where their five, they reared their five children. And they, when they built the home, instead of taking out trees, they left the trees on site. And although they do have some lawn, enough for kids to play on in the front of the house, the majority of the property they've left in a natural state. And this is what it looks like in spring as the woodland fills with the beautiful Virginia bluebells, a native flower. This photo on the right shows a pond and area of plants that includes quite a few native plants. This is a friend from our home ward in Maryland and she recently purchased a townhouse and took out the front lawn and put in this lovely um, invitation to nature. And on the left is a photo from Salt Lake City. This was a rental home my daughter lived in as a student. And the weedy lawn that was there, a hot, dry spot, was replaced with a variety of herbs and some vegetables, making it a productive area. So even if the area where you live has only a small amount of land, it's possible to use it in a more productive way than having lawn there either for yourself or as habitat for the creatures around us. And then as a leader of LDS Earth Stewardship East, we have created a native plant garden at a historic African-American site entitled Pleasant View. You can see details about this on our website. Um, but what was great about this project is it allowed me to teach others about the benefits of using native plants for building habitat and doing better at stormwater management. And we had more than 400 volunteers come help us plant and learn uh, about these techniques. And now I'm hearing from people that they're planting native trees, native shrubs, um, making a difference in their own home communities. And for example, the bishop of our ward, he and his wife have recently completely redone their backyard using a grant that they got as a consequence of having volunteered here at Pleasant View. So, and that's particularly important because their property happens to border one of the streams of our community. So directly impacting our watershed by having native plants. I happen to have taken this picture of a home in Centerville, Utah. No lawn in front. I don't know, I couldn't see the back, but I had permission to walk on the property and take, take these pictures. It's just a very lovely, inviting property. They've designed it in a manner using plants that don't require a lot of water. So not only do they not have to mow the lawn or use fertilizer or pesticides, herbicides to care for the lawn, um, they have, uh, they're using much less water. And I know in a place like Utah, unlike Maryland, uh, one of the problems with lawn uh, in dry climates is the fact that so much potable water is being used in a way that's not sustainable to keep these lawns green. So this is an alternative. And when we approach how we care for our properties, it's one way we answer this question that President Nelson poses. As beneficiaries of the divine creation, what shall we do? We should care for the earth, be wise stewards over it, and preserve it for future generation. And how we care for the, although it's wonderful to care about like the rainforests and other parts of the world and do things that are positive to impact them, we really should be caring uh, about the immediate area around us, the earth that we have direct, most direct responsibility for.
to be wise stewards. We're reminded by uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 59 verse 18 that God created this earth and everything on it not just to provide food for us and clothing but to please the eye to gladden the heart and to enliven our souls and I really feel that as I see the tremendous beauty and diversity around me in my garden as I've got diverse plants I have lots of diverse pollinators and in this case a diversity of, of butterflies all the photos on unless I said are from my garden so this is not my garden this is a neighbor also a member of our ward where they took one half of their yard that was lawn previously and filled it with a nice mix of plants many of which are native so in this talk I'm going to briefly address why we, what are the benefits of having less lawn and why would you want to include native plants when you're replacing well among other things uh, reducing your lawn means uh, for most people that they'll be using fewer herbicides and fertilizers and has a direct impact on water quality there's less pollution if you have a lawn and you mow it you are putting out pollution unless you have a hand pushed mower or uh, less polluting of course would be an electric mower but most people use gasoline powered mowers which are highly polluting um, one hour of you pushing a regular gas powered mower is equivalent to um, driving a new car for 40 hours for example in terms of the amount of air pollution put out also as I mentioned earlier about uh, in dry um, climates when we have lawns we're using a lot of water to water those lawns and so there are better uses for the water um, when we use plants that are native they're accustomed to the rainfall in an area you don't need to water um, and then of course it also in a place like where I live where we have plenty of water um, the concern is not conserving water as much as it is reducing stormwater runoff and turf grass is not very good at doing that whereas many of the the uh, native plants are excellent at holding water in place and these are just a few creatures in my garden and so finally the most important thing is when you don't have large areas of lawn and instead you have large areas of native plants you're able to support life great diversity of whatever are the creatures that should be living in your community so um, I what's a native plant a native plant is a plant which grows in an area without human intervention it was growing in uh, the area for example where we live prior to the arrival of European settlers this photo shows a, our, a side yard to our property and is an example of before I knew better and before I knew about the benefits of native plants I tended to plant based on what was available in the nursery trade along with what was just attractive to me and so I have a lot of non-natives and uh, including an example this Chinese silvergrass here is invasive I've since pulled it out I've since added many native plants um, but you might like to do a similar assessment what do you have in your property that is native here we have native white pines they're beautiful and um, the rest of these plants are not native so they're lovely but they don't provide habitat benefits in the same way that native plants would do and as a warning to you if you're buying plants and want to look for natives often cultivar names are not good a good indicator of whether something's native for example the viburnum here the name is Allegheny but the plant was never grown in the Allegheny Mountains it has nothing to do with North America it's a European Asian plant although there are viburnum that are native to Northeast North America this is not one of them the name wouldn't help you likewise crepe myrtles which are planted everywhere in the DC region you might think are native to our area but they are not but they are given names like Natchez um, Tonto Tuscarora named after Native Americans or Native American tribes you're seeing why and are thinking to yourself oh yeah what can I do either where I if I own property 
with my own property or if I'm a renter, what I can do in local uh, schools or parks or, or uh, churches to impact positively the way the property is used. And what is so important about native plants versus other types of decorative plants? Uh, well, 90% of the insects that eat plants can develop and reproduce only on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. So, uh, as you're probably aware, monarchs, for example, can only lay their eggs and their larvae can only develop and eat milkweed plants. They are unable to digest any other type of plant. Plants are the energy source for life, and insects are the way that energy is brought forward into higher, uh, larger um, animals. So when people try to kill insects, you know, spray to kill all the insects or whatever, they're really harming the whole network of, of life. And these are just some examples of um, the insects in my garden and many of which the wonderful interactions that exist between predators and prey and this wonderful web of life and um, just as an example this sunflower in the center i initially took the picture because of the bumblebee but then looking closer i see there's uh, at least three other bees and an, an ant on the same photo um, so life is being supported all around us by native plants Another specific example in our area, two butterflies I have in my garden because I've planted the plants they need as their host plants. So for example, this beautiful uh, zebra swallowtail, it needs pawpaw. So I have pawpaw trees in my property. The spice bush swallowtail, it can only lay its eggs on a spice bush. So we have spice bush growing here, both native plants to our area. You know, I, I've been a beekeeper for honeybees for a number of years, but what really makes me excited in my garden is when I go out and I see the native bees, of which there's uh, more than 445 um, at last count, and they come in all different sizes and colors. This um, The picture in the center of the metallic green, I see that bee in my garden. That, that picture and the one in the upper right were taken by Sam Drogi. The other pictures are mine. Um, so bees, birds, butterflies, and all the other creatures are going to be able to live if they have the native plants that they require. Dr. Tallamy, an entomologist of the University of Delaware, has published a book, Bringing Nature Home, and now has written several others on a similar theme. And he says, our gardens can be a wildlife preserve that represents the last chance we have for sustaining plants and animals that were once common. I've heard Dr. Tallamy speak multiple times and have read his books, and they have largely guided me in my personal journey towards reducing our lawn and creating habitat for life. One of the stories he shared was about the Eastern box turtle that next to the University of Delaware is a 40 acre undisturbed woodlot. In 1968, when they did a count of the turtles there, there were 91. Using the same survey um, techniques, they counted in tw 22 in 2002. In 2012, there were 12 turtles left, and the next, the number was going to be zero, according to Dr. Tallamy, because they're simply for 40 acres, 12 turtles, and their um, mating patterns and slow reproductive um, patterns, that this group of turtles were going to be going locally extinct. So this is an animal that used to be very common in the Northeast of, um, and where I live, but it's having a difficult time be between uh, the loss of habitat and the fact that when they, the female has to leave a woodland and find a meadow type place to, to lay her eggs. And generally, if there are woods and there are still turtles there and they leave the woods to lay their eggs, they instead find roads, parking lots, and uh, mown lawn, and there's nowhere to lay the eggs. And then the, the young turtles need three or four years of um, plant material to eat and hide in until they're grown enough to return to the woods. Okay, so we've set up a situation with our big lawns and excessive uh, development to, to make it so that these 
little turtles don't have a place to live. Hearing about this really got me motivated. So um, at the time we had have a property that's in kind of a rural area of two acres, but it was mostly lawn. Um, and so we started planting. I mean, I had already had some trees and shrubs planted, but I had done it more from an aesthetic background. And uh, after hearing Dr. Talamy, I started including more native plants and doing it for purposefully to create habitat. And I'm happy to say these pictures here are from my garden. I do see eastern box turtles. They found me. They're laying eggs. They have young who are living here. I don't see them very often. They're quite elusive. But usually once or twice a summer, I will get to see one of them. So here's a specific example where we live. Native dogwoods are they're beautiful tree, lovely white bloom, as you see here in the spring. That tree supports 117 different species of moths and butterflies. However, the Asian tree, dogwood, which is also sold in our nurseries and is also beautiful, it supports zero species of moths and butterflies. And again, this is also another example of a backyard without lawn. According to the owner, she says it's easy to take care of now that it's been established for some time. There are very few weeds because there's no lawnmower blowing weed seeds out into the, the beds. And um, she's worked with her neighbors who are also creating habitat and don't have as much lawn. So together they're creating a little woodland type environment that's good for habitat. This is the front walkway to my house, how it looks in the fall. This used to be lawn straight up to the house. And now that it's not lawn, these photos all are from that little part of my garden. Now, although not all the plants here are native, um, there are native plants that have brought these creatures to my garden. And then of course the turtle, or not the turtle, but the snake, frog, and skink here at the bottom, they live in the plant material, but I caught them on camera because they had slipped out temporarily onto the driveway. A nesting Carolina chickadee requires 400 caterpillars a day to feed her young. This is a study done by Dr. Talamy with his graduate students. So counting it up, they found that, that one nest of chickadees required between six and 9,000 caterpillars. That's just for until um, the baby birds fledge. And then there's about 24 more days where the adults are still feeding the young. So it's astonishing the number of caterpillars that are required. And if you don't have the trees and shrubs with the leaves that these caterpillars can eat, then we can't have our songbirds. And these are some of the birds that live in my garden. And I, I see on a regular basis at least 30 different species of birds. And it particularly makes me happy that I have a hawk that visits almost every day. Because that shows there's just a lot of uh, life going on because he can come here and find a meal. Then another thing to consider is the impact not just above the ground but underground of your plants. Turf grass, uh, I've got a green arrow there to show you in the diagram that turf grass has very shallow roots. And in comparison to many of the native plants which have much deeper roots, you can see why if you've got native plants that are accustomed to an area that um, say like Utah and the native plants probably will have deep roots and can survive long periods of time without rain, whereas the turf grass cannot. Um, and they do, the roots do a lot more than absorbing uh, the moisture and there's not time to talk about it because you could spend um, hours and hours talking about the benefits to the soil structure and um, watershed of the roots. But just visually, I think it's important to be aware when you're planting something, there are, things are happening underground as well as above. And just as a quick example, this is my property in the far corner of it where it slopes down. And um, when it rains, this was after one day after a one inch rain. And where we live, a one inch rain is a pretty common occurrence. We often have two or three inches at a time. So, uh, and this is the day after, not the day of. There's a culvert here that drains and goes under a road and it goes to a, a little streamlet that eventually feeds to Hooker's Branch, which feeds to Seneca Creek. The Potomac River. 
you can see from the color of this water there's been a lot of there's a lot of sediment and also the water comes from neighboring properties because of the flow of the land and it will bring with it if they're putting out herbicides fertilizers um, the oils off the roads you know so pollution and um, no chemicals that are going to have a negative impact on the watershed as well as the fact that water comes in carrying with it sediment which is one of the main problems with our waters waterways where we live is the sediment factor can be really be harmful okay you can also see by looking where there's turf grass that when the rain comes it becomes like a slide and the water just runs across the turf grass and disappears okay that's not good but i've started in this picture you can see i've started trying to put in plants now this is the same area five years later most of these are native plants and now when it rains even if it's a very heavy rain there's no buildup of water and what little tiny bit of water that comes out from my property is perfectly clear looks like you could drink it and it never builds up um, and backs up so it's dramatically changed the water uh, quality and reduce flooding downstream from us. If everybody did this, wow, what a difference it would make. As well as, now, this is providing a great deal of habitat. So I'm now gonna talk about just five quick steps that you can do to reduce your lawn and create habitat and have more life where you live. So one is, if you can't do anything else, choose one or as many native trees as your property can can manage and plant them. So where we live, there's beautiful, these are some trees from my front garden, uh, sugar maple in fall and uh, southern magnolia, beautiful. Okay, and we've planted, as I said, about 100 trees on my property and I have given away more than 2,000 native trees to my neighbors to try to build up our community uh, native tree bank. So, uh, even if you have a small property, there are many smaller trees that you could get. And often there are cultivated varieties that will still have some habitat benefit, like a dwarf of a tree, so long as the chemistry of the leaves is the same, often it will have um, a similar habitat value to the full size tree. So that's something to consider if you don't have a large property. And in Maryland, one of the great keystone species is oaks we have um, on on our oaks 534 species of caterpillars for butterflies and moss that eat the oak leaves and in Maryland um, we have 60 different species of oaks which are native so if in Maryland this if you have got the space is the tree to choose all right second besides uh, trees is choose some area of your lawn and replace that lawn with other native plants. It's great to have, if you have the space to do it, large trees, small understory trees, shrubs, and perennial, and then ground covers. So you have plants of different heights and shapes and sizes. But you know, do what you can, and you can just take a small area. You can just put down newspaper, thick sections of newspaper overlapping, and then cover it with some aged compost and then mulch. And with time, the grass underneath decays. You don't need to use chemicals like Roundup. And that makes a great new bed. That's how I've made all of my beds. Now, another thing you can do is, um, I, I don't do this, but if you don't mind a little more work, you can weed whack the area first, um, cutting it the area down to ground um, level, and then uh, cover it with a newspaper or cardboard and compost and mulch you can also mix in other organic matter like leaves this time of year this is a great time of year to do this um, an area prepared like this will be ready to be planted in by spring and in fact here's an example of a when i'm just starting this you can see i've got some in the distance you some redbud trees i've started and now like if i were to take a current picture you'd see almost no lawn because it's all been converted into plant other plants but anyway you start small so i started with a sm small little crescent here and in the fall i put in some bulbs because they could just grow on top of the grass basically in the compost mulch 
that I had there and I had planted a few trees and shrubs into this little bed and then in the spring I widened it by one width of newspapers and um, year by year I've been doing that and the bed this is the same bed now full of native plants creating habitat and uh, now there's just a little bit of lawn versus mostly lawn the third thing uh, it greatly enhances the habitat value of your property if you can have a pond and these can be very simple like uh, you can buy a liner for around $35 a 7 by 10 foot liner dig a hole it takes a couple of hours in the afternoon to do this you don't need a filter you don't need a pump you don't need chemicals you just fill it with water buy some little goldfish 19 cents a fish at, at PetSmart a few water plants you can edge with rocks and that becomes an easy, low maintenance pond. You don't need to do anything else. Um, and it really adds a lot of habitat value. We'll have um, frogs and toads and other creatures that are able to live where there's water. And a lot of the pollinators, you, people don't think about like the bees and other insects, they need access to water. So birds, it just dramatically improves the habitat value of your property if you've got access to clean water and especially for amphibians there's been a lot of habitat loss and contamination of aquatic sites and over time um, human actions have really had a negative impact so by creating a little bit of the habitat you are allowing these creatures to have a place to live and they're a lot of fun and they I know in my garden that the kids like to come and see what toads and frogs they can find this is an area where I have two little ponds you can see where the boys are looking and then up where the elephant ears are there's another pond now those are not uh, those are tropical not native but I do use a mix I have some non-native plants in my garden they are a good plant for when you're trying to get a new area established and that was a pond I had just put in that year and uh, again so the eggs here are toad eggs they look like a beautiful necklace and um, I, unfortunately my face is covering it but this little boy is holding a container of tadpoles he's captured so you, you get to enjoy the cycles of life um, by adding a pond okay so another thing you can do is eat your lawn I don't mean literally but you can turn areas of your lawn into food production these are peach trees and I am NOT mowing the lawn underneath it and then beyond the peach trees a vegetable garden and I grow enough to feed not just our family but many neighbors and friends uh, so it becomes a productive instead of just a, an area of lawn that's being mown finally mow no more uh, as you can see with two acres it's more than I could manage to transition everything into native plants um, all at once so that there are parts in back that I haven't yet transitioned um, I have maybe 10 years ago stopped mowing except just paths and it's turned out to be like great the long grass actually is habitat I see creatures living in it and it doesn't need to be mown I have to weed it to keep out um, invasive plants but I don't it really doesn't need as much weeding as like the mown areas of the lawn that get a lot more weeds in them than this long grass so uh, simple reduce your work increase habitat reduce the amount of air pollution finally this is again our website for our little local LDS or stewardship and I've got a lot of information there there's a whole section of the website on uh, native plants and um, invite you to check it out and also when you're looking at it you could check out and learn more about this um, Pleasant View historic uh, site that we've create where we've created a native plant garden if you live in Utah you might visit the Red Butte Gardens for ideas on ways to conserve water in your gardens they have three acres demonstrating gardens of low water plantings and wherever you live I wish you well at, on this wonderful journey towards less lawn and more life